All right, Bible warfare, how to defend your faith. This is lesson number 10 in the series. Uh, we're going to talk about church organization uh, tonight. Uh, last week we reviewed the major religions in the world and we examined their beliefs and teachings uh, in a kind of a survey fashion concerning salvation or heaven or paradise or the hereafter. And one of the things that I remarked was that every religion has some teaching concerning the afterlife. Most people um, who uh, seek out religion are usually seeking out that religion for what it offers them concerning their, quote, salvation. And we noted some important points when uh, comparing this area of belief among the 12 major organized religions and philosophies of the world. There are more than 12 religions, but most of them can fit into the, in, you know, underneath one of the major ones. So there are many offshoots of Hinduism, many different types of Buddhism and so on and so forth, but the major organized ones uh, number 12. So a couple of things that we learned just to kind of review a bit. 11 of the 12 religious systems relied on law-based or works-oriented methods of achieving salvation or paradise or ultimate peace, whatever you want to call it. That was a very interesting idea. 11 of the 12 use, 12 use law-based things. In other words, you've got to do something. You've got to try. You know, in Hinduism, you keep coming back and why are you coming back? In order to improve. You've got to improve and try and get better until you earn your way into uh, paradise. We also says, said that Christianity was the only religion where the burden for man's salvation rested with God and was offered freely to man on a basis of faith. Christianity, you know, the philosophy of our religion, you know, our theology concerning salvation, is unique among all the religions in the world. I mean, they have different ways that they dress and they have different customs and they have different ways to worship and they describe their gods in different ways and all of that business. But when it all comes down to it, when it comes down to the important part of, okay, what happens after death or what is the, uh, you know, what is the status of paradise? For all the other religions, you have to work your way in. Christianity is unique in that way. God offers freely to man his, her salvation based on belief, based on faith. I believe that God has given this to me through Christ. Now, of course, uh, I express my faith through repentance, through baptism, through, you know, through, through faithfulness. But nevertheless, God is the one that has the burden of, you know, paying the moral debt for my sins. I don't, make uh, I don't make restitution for my sin. It's one of the most misunderstood ideas about Christianity, that somehow we have to make some kind of restitution for the bad and stupid things that we have done. We need to understand uh, you know, the crux, the core of Christianity teaches us that Jesus Christ on the cross makes 100% of the restitution necessary for all the bad and horrible things that we may have done in our life. He makes restitution for that. We do not make restitution. We can't, that's the point. We can't do it. We, we can't offer to God what is necessary to make restitution for the sins that we have committed. In other religions you have to. The various spiritual exercises and discipline and asceticism and all that business, that all counts as points, but not in Christianity. And then the, another point, when compared, the nature of salvation in the Christian religion is far superior in value and experience than any of the others. I said if you only had one thing to study or discuss with someone concerning, you know, the difference between Christianity and another thing. And if you get to choose, choose salvation. Choose to discuss the quality of salvation, the experience of salvation that is offered by Christianity in comparison to the experience of salvation offered by some other religion and how you get there. And when you compare these two things, it becomes very obvious that Christianity is superior. And once a person knows the difference, 
they would not choose any other method or reward than the one that Jesus offers through His cross. Okay, so those are some of the things we, uh, we talked about last week, in case you weren't here. Uh, we've discussed at length uh, many questions about church life and of course salvation, which we were talking about last week and, and uh, this evening. Uh, we're now going to move on to some questions that were asked by fewer people and cover a wider range of uh, topics. For example, what is meant by congregational autonomy? We're always talking about congregational autonomy. Where, you know, where does that come from? I believe that part of this question has to do with why we don't have a headquarters or regional supervisors. I've been asked that. You know, people want to know about the church. Of Where's your headquarters? <laughs> and you, know, you seem facetious if you say, well, our headquarters is in heaven. And you go, oh yeah, they're smarty aleck. You know. No, really, our headquarters is in heaven. Yes, but where? You know, where? Where is the Oklahoma headquarters for all the churches? There is no headquarters anywhere. And they, people find that hard to believe. Really? How do you do things if you've got you know, no, no regional supervision or anything like that? No, we don't have that. Uh, so we're now going to move on to questions that, at, that are asked concerning this particular topic. Um, I believe that part of this question, again, uh, has to do with the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the confusion that people have about how the church is organized. Many churches or quote denominations are organized based on different models. So let's start there. For example, the Roman Catholic Church follows the empirical Roman model of government. I should have put a slide up there showing you know, the Roman model of government. You have the emperor, you have the senate, you have the, you know, and it just goes down, all the way down. And if you put next to that, the organizational model for the Catholic Church, it's exactly the same. The, 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 uh, the way that power is broken down and responsibility, same thing. Um, uh, there's a supreme leader, the Pope, just like in the Roman Empire, there was a supreme leader, the emperor, you see what I'm saying? There is a college of advisors in the Catholic Church called cardinals, Roman Empire, the senators. Uh, there were regional leaders and governors you know, in, in the Roman system. Well, there are regional leaders in Roman Catholicism. They're called archbishops. Um, they oversee various territories, which are each led by lesser ranking clerics that are called bishops, who are responsible for several churches and then the local priest uh, you know, is responsible for the local church. And so the Roman Catholic Church model is really based on the Roman empirical model. Uh, the Protestant, many Protestant denominations, um, they did away with the papal head. In other words, they got rid of the idea of the Pope in their church organization but they maintained the same top-down ranking system. They simply gave different names to the positions and they gave more power to the regional groups of leaders who serve as a kind of religious court, synods, for example, in the Presbyterian church. Same idea though, you know, the, there's, you know, there's leadership at the top, except they don't have one single leader. They have kind of, you know, they break it down in that fashion uh, in different, uh, regions. Um, the evangelical churches, they have a modified system based more on the American political system than the old European classical or ecclesiastic model. If you know anything about the evangelical churches, you know, like Southern Baptists, they have conventions. They have regional groups that vie for votes. They send delegates to the conventions that have a vote. And so in a, in a piece of doctrine or a something, uh, you know, some way to do something in the church you know, um, comes up, well, at the convention, the delegates, they, they vote yes or no, up or down. Is this what we're going to do? That's how they decide things. Very American. They sit on boards or councils 
There's competition as to who will be selected as a delegate to go to the regional conference. And which one of these is going to sit on a board? How do you think, how do you think uh, that in certain denominations, openly gay practicing homosexuals became uh, you know, full-time ministers, even bishops. How, how do you think that happened? Uh, it was decided upon in a convention. And that convention was packed with liberal thinking delegates. And when that vote came up, uh, the ones who said, well, wait a minute, in the Bible it says that this is an abomination. They were in the minority. They got voted down. That's how you get there. <laughs> the people who voted in favor of a thing like that, their argument was, well, you know, Paul, uh, you know, the cultural argument, Paul was a product of his times. In those days, homosexuality was you know, looked down upon, but today we're so much more enlightened, we're so much more advanced, we got to let go of those things. You know? That argument won the day. Um, sectarian groups, Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, and so on and so forth, uh, they have a more patriarchal approach um, where a, a relative or hand-picked hand successor to the original founder wields great influence and great, great power. These leaders have veto power over the various church and regional leaders and agenda. There's some things in the local congregations of Jehovah Witnesses uh, that they have to kind of run up you know, the chain of command that goes all the way to the top leader uh, in, order to, um, in order to be approved. So they have a patriarchal system. Now a few weeks ago I explained that what made us different from all other Christian groups or churches was twofold, two things that make us different. Number one, we believe that the entire Bible is inspired and therefore the Bible is our authoritative guide in matters of morals, spiritual things, you know, religion. The Bible is what guides us. From beginning to end, we believe it's inspired. And you have people you know, in other religious groups that say, well, we believe the Bible's inspired. Yes, they say that. But if you scratch the surface a little bit and you, go, you dig down, they don't always believe that the entire Bible is inspired. Yeah, everything's expired except a couple of chapters in Romans and you know. I had a fellow from the United Kingdom write to me. Uh, he's a member of the church, one of the congregations there, and um, I, believe he's in, I believe he's in England. And he's a you know, Bible talk guy. He, he discovered Bible talk and he was baptized and he started going to church there blah, 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 a couple of years ago and he wrote me back and and he feels that the, perhaps the church that he's with now, he doesn't understand why they do certain things. And he said to me, um, uh, our minister uh, doesn't believe that Romans 9, 10, and 11, uh, he said, that's just Paul ruminating. You know? He's just talking out loud. That's not really inspired thing. That's not an inspired thing. Well, wow. Romans 9, 10, and 11 is where Paul is explaining why the Jews stumbled and didn't accept Jesus as the Messiah. I don't know about you, but to me, that's pretty important. <laughs> Why the Jewish nation rejected its own Messiah? That's a lot more than just rumination. You know? That's extremely important. He didn't mention any other things, but he wasn't, he wasn't sure. Uh, and what I said to him, I said, well, it's always dangerous, especially when the leaders in the church you know, those who are charged with teaching the church, when the leaders in the church begin skipping through the Bible and saying, yeah, nah, nah, this isn't inspired, oh, this is inspired, this is important and this is not important, you know, when human teachers are taking on that kind of responsibility, it's not a good road to go down, okay? So in the churches of Christ, we believe in the complete inspiration of the Bible. Does that mean we can explain everything? No. No. How does God create something from nothing? 
Can you explain that to me metaphysically, biologically, physiologically? You know, can, can you explain that? You know, can, you, can you mathematically, can you make me an equation that'll you know, equal you know, nothing, there's nothing and then there's something? I can't understand that. How does the Spirit of God dwell inside of my body? Can you explain that to me, exactly how that happens? No. Does that mean that it's not true? Well, no. I mean, to modern man who thinks that anything he cannot explain must not be true or valid, but there are many things. The Bible even says, we know by faith, I think in the book of Hebrews, we know by faith that God create, what God created, He, 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 he took from, from nothing. How do we know that? Well, we know by faith. Were we there on the day of creation? Well, no. Well, how do we accept it? We accept it by faith now. So the point I'm trying to make here is just because we cannot explain it logically at times doesn't mean it's not true and doesn't mean that we have to kind of eject that from the Bible. There are many things we couldn't explain uh, but with time began to understand. I think you know this. This is an old, uh, you know, uh, apologetic argument, you know, the Hittites, the, Bi the Bible mentions a tribe of people called the Hittites. And uh, for many, many years, archeologists and historians say there is no archeological record of a group of people that lived in the Holy Land called the Hittites. And it was the major argument of atheists against the inspiration of the Bible. I mean, if it's wrong on the Hittites, it might be wrong about other things. And, and you know, it was a major sledgehammer that, that they kept smashing Christians with. Where, there are no Hittites, you see what I'm saying? And it was one of those things that you accepted by faith because you, you didn't have the physical evidence to demonstrate that they existed until I think it was 1940 something or other. And whoops, whoops, archeologists, stumble across, as they usually do, they're digging around, whoops, they stumble across a city, a village, Hittites, writing, references, history, objects, and guess what? All of it fits with what the Bible said, the Old Testament said about the Hittites. Now no archeologists and no ancient historian doubts the existence of, the, I mean, they're extinct now, but no one doubts that they existed because now there's proof. But long before the proof came along, the Bible was talking about these people. As a matter of fact, most archeologists use the Bible in order to search for these things because it is the, you know, it is the best record, the best piece of information in order to find these ancient places. Anyways, I'm digressing a little bit. The thing that people <clears throat> need to know about us is we believe the Bible is completely inspired. And then the second thing, we believe that the Bible teaches that we should consciously be trying to establish and operate the church as closely as possible to the teachings, the commands, and the guidelines given to us in the New Testament. Someone will say, why? Why should we do that? Because this is what the New Testament teaches us concerning these matters. What does the New Testament teach concerning the church? The New Testament teaches us that we should organize it and make it function according to the rules and information contained in the New Testament. That's what it teaches. We call this New Testament Christianity. Pretty handy, isn't it? <laughs> what kind of Christian are you? I'm a New Testament Christian. Oh, you go to the Church of Christ, what kind of church is that? Answer, uh, that's a New Testament church. That is the correct answer. Not, uh, they say to you, so what kind of church is that? And you say, well, you know, uh, we don't use instruments. The, no, that's not the good answer. Or we baptize people, you know, full immersion. That's not, yeah, we do that. Yes, we do that. <laughs> but that's not the answer to that question. What kind of church is that? You go to the Choctaw, what kind of church is that? That's a New Testament church. <laughs> the beauty of that answer is it invites another question. And the question that it invites is, New Testament church? What kind of church is that? <laughs> the answer to that is, 
It's a church that follows the New Testament in the way it's organized and the way it functions. And usually when you say that, they go, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> Just those two points. If you could just get those two points across when you're talking to somebody about church, it's amazing what you've established. Because after those two points are made, every other question they ask you is going to be answered in the same way. Well, what about such and such? Well, okay, the New Testament says, okay. So our church is a New Testament church because we follow this principle, the principle of following the New Testament instructions for how the church should be organized and function. Now, historically, the effort to use strictly the New Testament organization and teaching and practice has simply been referred to as restorationism. We are part of the restoration movement historically. Are we part of the reformation movement? No, we're not part of that movement. We're part of the restoration movement to restore the organization and the function of the church as it was in apostolic times. We are trying to duplicate this first century model in the 21st century, that's what we're doing. If you want like the big picture, I mean we have the little picture, right? Wednesday night church, uh, you know, uh, groceries for poor people, uh, supporting missionaries, uh, preaching, uh, you know, the, if you get down in the weeds you know, about what we're doing, but if you stand back and, and ask, what is it all about? What are you people trying to do as a group? As a group, what we're trying to do is to restore the operation and function of the church as it was in the first century. Obviously, they didn't have electric lights, they didn't have microphones or TVs, but those things are, are not important. The, the New Testament doesn't talk about that in any way. You know, the New Testament says we should go out and preach Jesus and baptize uh, repentant believers. Now, how we go, by car, by boat, by plane, how we preach through TV, radio, video, you know, whatever, there's no instruction on that. The instruction is simply go, preach Christ, immerse and water those who repent and, uh, and believe. That hasn't changed in 21 centuries. That's the same thing, okay? So with this mindset and approach, when the question arises, how are we going to organize the church on a local uh, and on an international level? Well, we go to the New Testament to see what instructions we have there about this topic, about, you know, we got instructions about how to baptize somebody by immersion in water. Well, we also have instructions on how do we organize the church and how should it function? We have this instruction in the New Testament. And when we review the New Testament about church organization, <coughs> There are many teachings and examples concerning ministry, the qualification of leaders in the church, and the makeup and organization of the New Testament church. So according to the New Testament, a Christian church was made up of the following groups. You had baptized believers. You're a member of the church if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You repent of your sins and you are immersed by the authority of or in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you have done that, you have been added to the spiritual body of the church. Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Now, in the church, there are several roles or offices of leadership in this organization. Ephesians 4, 11, 1 Timothy 3, Acts 20, all these passages. For example, you have apostles. Who were the apostles? They were the messengers of Christ, specifically the 12 in the upper room at Pentecost, and Paul, the apostle, later called to preach to the Gentiles. That one, that's one group uh, that uh, was in the um, New Testament church. Uh, the apostles were men who witnessed the baptism of Jesus, His ministry, they witnessed his death, they witnessed his resurrection and his ascension. That's what made them special. 
the term apostle means somebody who is sent, like an ambassador is sent with a certain authority. Well, they are sent to proclaim, they were sent to proclaim what they had witnessed. Another group that was part of the church, prophets, those who spoke the word directly given to them by God. Am I a prophet today? Yes, I am, by virtue of the fact of what I'm doing, except I did not come by my ministry miraculously, as did the prophets in the first century. My ministry comes to me through just old-fashioned study. <laughs> Reading, study, research, writing, but it's the same ministry in the end. In the end, I'm communicating the meaning of God's word. The difference was in the first century, the prophets who had no access to New Testament uh, material yet, it hadn't been written, they spoke directly from God, just like the prophets in the Old Testament did. Okay? They were like walking Bibles. Um, another group, elders, pastors, bishops, uh, different words, I think we had a class on this, you know, elders or presbyters, same word describing the same person, referring to that person's maturity or age, or you could call that person a pastor or a shepherd, okay? uh, which referred to the ministry of that individual, as a shepherd, a caregiver, and then bishop or overseer, again, different words describing not the age of that individual, not the task of that individual, but the authority of that individual. That, author, that individual is given authority by God through the church and the word of God to oversee, uh, the, uh, to lead if you wish. All right? So different terms that refer to the same person, an older or experienced Christian man who is a spiritual leader and mentor in the congregation and serve mainly as teachers. And then you have uh, evangelists. We call them preachers. We call them ministers, same thing. Different terms referring to one who ministered the word of God to the church and proclaimed the gospel to the lost. For example, I am ministering the word to the church this evening. Okay? On BibleTalk.tv, I am proclaiming the gospel to the world. And yet I'm using, you know, whereas Paul had to you know, walk and go from city to city, thankfully with uh, modern technology, uh, Hal and I are able to go from city to city, anywhere in the world and proclaim uh, the gospel uh, to individuals. But it's the same task. We're just using different uh, technology uh, today. Evangelists are also responsible for planting new churches. They're responsible for organizing the church along the lines of the New Testament pattern. Okay? That's a task of the evangelists. Um, another group, uh, deacons, men who ministered the various needs of church members. So we need to understand elders had a ministry of leadership. Evangelists have a ministry of the word, and deacons have a ministry of service. Each ministry given to each man by God, through the church, according to God's word. We also have teachers, teachers, those qualified and trained to teach the word. And then of course, there are the saints, the saints are baptized believers. Now, every member of Christ's body is a saint. The term saint simply means one who is separated. So you're a saint if you are separated from the world. How? Through repentance and baptism. You're separated from the world through repentance and baptism and become part of the body of Christ. And your position in the body of Christ is as a saint. So every single person in the body of Christ or in the church is a saint. However, some saints, because of their skills or gifts or training or experience, some saints are appointed to serve in some particular role or other. 
So all the saints serve Christ in one way or another, but some of those saints are given special responsibility within the congregation. Uh, elders, deacons, evangelists, you see what I'm saying? So everybody is responsible for teaching other people as they can. But teachers are given the responsibility to teach the entire congregation. See what I'm saying? All right. So once the New Testament was completed, a couple of centuries it took for not only it to be completed and circulated and, 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 and brought together into one text, it took a while, but once the New Testament was completed, the work of the apostles and the prophets was then being done by the word itself. For example, it says all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training for righteousness. Well in the beginning the apostles did that and the prophets did that. Why? Because they miraculously had the word of God within them and they taught with authority because they were teaching through the power of the Holy Spirit. They didn't have the record yet. God was putting the record on their hearts and they were recording it. Okay? Today we still have the same roles in the church except that the apostles and the prophet whose work was complete in the first century, their work is now done through the Bible. So the apostles were the witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus and they went about making a witness of that. Today they're gone, right? And, they're, and what made them special is no one else was present at the baptism and resurrection of Jesus, just these 12, well, you know, with Paul 13. And they were proclaiming what they saw. Well, they recorded their witness and today the work of proclaiming a witness of the resurrection is now done through the word of God. The work of the prophets uh, who served the church by educating the church what was the mind of God at the beginning, their work is no longer necessary. We don't have people who have the quote gift of prophecy being able to know the future or predict the future or to know through the Holy Spirit, what God is teaching. Well, today we have everything contained in this book here concerning what God wants to teach the church. So the role of the prophet is no longer, you know, the miraculous prophet. We don't need him or her anymore. Today we have all of the mind of God contained in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. And so the task of the apostle and the prophet is now completed by the word of God. So today, again, all the same roles except the Bible provides the witness and the message of Christ. Now, there's a reason why I've gone, all of, gone over all of these roles, and I think you're all familiar, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here, I think you're all familiar with the role, but there's a reason that I've been careful to you know, explain each of these roles. Um, if we understand that these are the roles authorized by the New Testament, then it means that any other position or office or authority in the church aside from these roles are merely inventions of human beings. They're man-made offices, man-made roles without the blessing, the authority, or any basis in the New Testament. So a man can call himself the Archbishop of Chicago or whatever, responsible for several other, or Archbishop of Illinois, you know, responsible for several city and several bishops. And he may live in a mansion, many do, and have a chauffeur and you know, live like a, you know, a high flying politician and have all that authority. But all that authority that he wields in that particular group has not been given to him by God, has not been sanctioned by the New Testament. So someone says, how's your church different from mine? Well, it's different in that we don't have any roles in the church that are not authorized by the New Testament. That's why we don't have cardinals, we don't have art. Do we have bishops? Oh yeah, we have bishops. Oh, okay. Do you have cardinals? No. Where do you see cardinal in here? You don't see that. How about archbishop? I don't see archbishop. Do you have deacons? Oh yeah, we have deacons. Why? Because we, we have instructions here. 
to elect and select deacons and put them to work. Another thing that is re quite remarkable when studying this question is what you do not see in the New Testament concerning church organization. You do not see any of the modern systems of church hierarchy that exist in these other groups that I mentioned before. In the New Testament church, each congregation was autonomous and led by its own local leaders. This is how we are extremely different than others. There are very few church groups. Um, uh, there's a church group, uh, I think out of England, called Congregationalist Churches. And that's one of their features. They're autonomous, like uh, we are. Um, oh yes, different churches uh, ask for advice and uh, received help from the apostles you know, back in the day from the uh, apostles in Jerusalem, but this was because they did not yet possess the entire New Testament record and the apostles, you know, they were the source of scriptural authority back then. But today, today we, we have the scriptural authority right here and we have plenty of people in the church that know it and can study it in order to resolve issues and problems and make decisions according to what the Bible says. We also notice that every mention of congregational leadership in the Bible, for example, in Acts 20 or Philippians chapter 1 verse 1, every time Paul or someone refers to the, the leaders in a congregation, they always refer to a group of elders or bishops or overseers. There's always more than one. There's never a spot in the New Testament where they refer to only one who is the pastor of a single congregation. It's always to the elders. Paul, you know, it says Paul called to himself the elders from Ephesus. There were more than one. There's always more uh, than one. It was a collegiate type of, um, of leadership. Uh, and so this uh, leads us to the conclusion today, we ask ourselves, so how many elders should we have in our, you know, let's say we're organizing a brand new congregation, how many elders should we have? Well, according to the New Testament, you need more than one. You need at least two. You can have 10 if you want. I know in Edmond, how many do they have, 40? I mean, but they've got 2,000 people. <laughs> they need a lot of elders there. Here we don't have that many, but we still have a good number of elders who lead. Okay. So when we put the pieces together concerning congregational organization, this is the picture that emerges, not from the Church of Christ, this is the picture that emerges from the New Testament. First, churches met mainly in homes or in cluster of homes in each city and sometimes they used public places when these places were available. And we read about that in Acts chapter 19, verse nine, and throughout the book of Romans. Another feature, uh, each congregation had a number of leaders, depending on the size and the maturity of their congregation, and these leaders included elders and teachers and deacons who had specific responsibility for different areas of church life. Um, as the apostles died off, the recorded word replaced the need for prophets and there were more evangelists and so the preachers remained longer with individual congregations and served as missionaries to other nations. At the beginning, there weren't enough preachers to, get, to go around. So preachers served several congregations, teaching and encouraging, much like Jeffrey Karima. Jeffrey Karima in Kenya, he serves oh, maybe five to eight different congregations. He's a circuit preacher. And in his hometown, that's where the School of Theology is, and that's where they train future preachers. And, and the reason for the training is he wants to provide preachers for all these churches that he's servicing. Okay? Well, that's pretty much how it was at the beginning. There weren't enough preachers to take care of all the congregations. That's why Paul would go and plant a church and then maybe two years later would come back to that church to see how they were doing. And, you know, so we do the same thing today in the very same, in the very same way. 
Um, another point, uh, these autonomous or this autonomous congregational style remained in place until it was um, um, uh, replaced, if you wish, by the Catholic model of you know, the empirical model uh, gradually in the second, third, you know, fourth uh, uh, century. There we go. So if we want to practice uh, New Testament Christianity, we need to renew the model of autonomous congregations with local leaders all held together by a common belief and commitment to follow God's pattern in the New Testament for church structure and organization. Churches of Christ, you know, there may be what, 20, 25,000 congregations of the churches of Christ in the world. We can't count them because so many of them are house churches. So many of them you know, are beginning churches. Because we don't have a superstructure with a, you know, a pope at that top and you know, regional leaders counting heads, we can't count how many there are. But those congregations who have matured to the point where they have a property, where they meet at and you know, they put out some information, they have a local preacher that, that, that serves that. You know, those congregations that have grown to that point, you know, there's thousands, tens of thousands of them all over the world. You can't go anywhere where you cannot find a church of Christ. Well, certainly not in the United States. As a matter of fact, in the United States, they, they show different statistics for different you know, denominational groups, let's put it that way. And uh, we're not the largest by far. You know, we're, not, we're, not, we're, we're, we're larger than the Jehovah Witnesses, let's put it that way. Uh, but one category where we excel, all right, is that we're spread out more evenly than any other group. In other words, if you added up all the counties in all of the United States, churches of Christ have congregations in more counties than any other religious group in the United States. Why is that? Because most of the churches of Christ are about 100 to 150 people and serve a very tight community. I've said this before, and of course, you know, Edmund Church, Memorial Church, they're, they're hybrids, they're the exception. They're the 0.001% of, of churches of Christ, that the churches that have 2,000 and 3,000 members, a wonderful thing, big churches can do big things, but they're the exception to the rule. Most churches of Christ are like us. You know, uh, 150, and then you, you get to a kind of a medium size like us, maybe three or 400 people, that's about the size of a church of Christ. That's a manageable size, okay? Usually when you get much bigger than that, you, you have to change the way that you do church. And a good, um, you know, a good position is uh, once you start getting very big, usually the decision is, what do we do? Do we just make a bigger place where people can sit and listen to the sermon? Or do we take our resources, our human resources and our, our, our physical resources and maybe check around to see where, where is there no church? One of the churches that supports Bible talk is the Gold Hill Road Church of Christ in, um, in South Carolina. And I, 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 um, I really admire that congregation. They're, they're about our size. They're about our size, same attendance, you know, and so on and so forth. But in the last uh, you know, eight years, they've planted two new churches because they, they, don't, you know, they get so full and instead of just, you know, moving and building some big auditorium to seat a thousand people, what they do is they, they get volunteers and they'll pick maybe 75 to 100 people and that group will then form another congregation. They'll look around to see where there's no church, where there's no congregation. And they go and buy the land, build the building, and the 100 people go in and boom, they're ready to go right away. And how do they know what to do? <laughs> They have the blueprint. And the elders at the Gold Hill Road Church, they're not, they don't oversee that other church. That other church is an autonomous church, but they know what to do, why? They follow the same pattern that Gold Hill Road. 
And one of the things, one of the arguments against that, you know, I was talking to the preacher there, he says, well, people are usually afraid. They think, man, if we, you know, we're 400, if we were to take 75 to 100 people, man, that's a big hole. You know, we're going to, you know, our budget's going to go down and you know, the church is going to shrink. And every time they do this, that hole fills up in three months. <laughs> the Lord provides in some way, but that hole just fills up. And I seem to think it's because all of a sudden there are a lot of missing parts and people who normally don't do much, they step up to the plate. Because the guy who was a real you know, go-getter and he decided to go with his family to the new church to get it started, well all the stuff he was doing, nobody's doing anymore. And, and, and so somebody who's been kind of sitting back and watching all of a sudden realizes, you know what, I think maybe it's time I got up and I got a chance to serve that I didn't have before. So just a little insight as to uh, the churches of Christ and our New Testament pattern for organization and function. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it.